Our New Testament reading is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. First Thessalonians chapter three, beginning at verse one. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain." But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God, night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may may establish your hearts unblameable and holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Amen. Our text this evening is found in Ephesians chapter 6, and we'll be considering verse uh, 12. Let's read verse 11 uh, and verse 12 that will focus most of our attention on verse 12. Last Wednesday evening, we uh, took up for consideration under the ministry of God's word, Satan and his angels. There we had set forth what the Bible teaches us about these uh, fallen angels, their origin and present uh, activity and uh, character and so on. This evening we transition to speaking about the spiritual war that we are engaged in with them and against them. So Ephesians 6, beginning at verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We are embroiled in a significant war, terrible war. You read the words of Ephesians 6, And the tone is martial, isn't it? It's as if you can hear the sound of the bugle uh, in the background and you can hear the call to battle that is issued uh, through these uh, inspired words. You'll note that it is a frontal assault that we are called to. It is a frontal assault. He tells us uh, to stand So there you have it in verse 11, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Then you turn and look at the armor that the Lord has furnished his people with, and there's uh, much that is described there as part of our arsenal. But amidst all of the pieces of armor, you'll notice that there is nothing for covering the back. No piece of armor for the back of the Christian. And that is because, as I said, we're engaged in a frontal assault. No provision for retreat, no provision for tucking tail, turning our back to the enemy, 
and fleeing from him. We are called to stand, and that call is repeated at least three uh, times uh, in this uh, particular passage. And all of this reminds us, doesn't it, that we are engaged in a war that is so often overlooked. So we're, we're, in, we're actually engaged uh, with a war in the unseen part of the created world. So just as we uh, noted with regards to the elect angels, so too with the fallen angels, there are these created beings that God has brought into existence that uh, are beyond the reach of sense perception. We can't touch, taste, uh, see, hear, smell them. And yet uh, they are as real, of course, as, as we are. And there we have uh, the world around us. And they're, of course, suppressing the truth. So they're not thinking about God who is unseen. They're not thinking about their own soul and tending to it, which is unseen. They're not thinking about eternity. And it's no surprise to us that they're giving little thought uh, to this cosmic war that is taking place all around us uh, in the, the world at large. In fact, the, the unconverted walk mindlessly in the midst of all of this. So they, they are like a little child, no armor, no helmet, no weaponry, nothing but the shirt on their back and perhaps bare feet running through the midst of a battlefield. You think, this is, this is insanity. And yet that's how the Bible uh, describes it. In fact, they are not only such, but they have been led captive. They have been brought under the captivity of uh, the devil's uh, influences. They're not, as it were, neutral and, and at large. And the battle is a personal one. It's not just, as we so often hear in uh, the New Age-ish type of rhetoric, you know, this, this war between good and evil, these these forces that are opposing uh, one another as if it was uh, just some sort of ethereal uh, uh, matter that we're discussing. No, it's, it is very personal. We have a personal being, Satan, which we discussed last time, and his personal agents, uh, the fallen uh, angels, who are very intent in seeking to attack and undermine all that is good. We have uh, elect angels who likewise are engaged in, in this, uh, this war within the, the heavens. So we, we see reference to it in places like uh, Jude 9 and, and specifically to Michael the archangel where it says, yet Michael the archangel when contending with the devil. So you see there's, there's combat that's taking place. He disputed about the, the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. We see the same thing described in places like Daniel 9, and we could go on, some of which we, we alluded to or touched on last week. But it is also personal because we are involved in it. And that's what this text, of course, is about. He's writing to the church and saying, put on the whole armor of God, that ye, as people, as, as believers, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The devil is, uh, sees the Christian as a target and is aiming uh, to dislodge uh, our confidence in his word and to lead us into uh, all manner of sin. And though he, he cannot do anything apart uh, or outside of, of God's own bidding and will, nevertheless, he is fomenting with fury against the, the Lord's people. And so we are engaged against the devil himself. We are called to resist him. We are called uh, to quench his fiery darts. We are told that he flees from us. This is personal language. We're not talking about um, some force out there. We're personally engaged in this battle. So that's what we're going to take up uh, with the Lord's help this evening. And we'll note a few things. First of all, uh, the enemy's power. So first of all, the enemy's power. Here we have in our text these words, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places or in the heavenly. So we note first that this is a supernatural power. 
Paul is saying, let's be clear here. We are not fighting merely flesh and blood. We're not merely engaged with people, with other human beings, but there is a spiritual and supernatural combat. This is where uh, we are so often misguided and perhaps uh, mistaken. We, we recognize institutions and structures and religions as, as evil, and we recognize uh, those who are perpetuating and propagating the ideo- ideology of these places as evil, but we overlook at times the evil behind the evil, as it were, that the devil is in fact utilizing uh, these things for his own uh, purposes. We see it within the realm of politics. We see it within uh, radical and, and pagan institutions. You see it within religion. I mean, the, the, the Apostle Paul tells us that idolatry needs to be recognized for what it is. So in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, verse 19, he says, What say I then, that the idol is anything? Or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? In other words, the the image itself. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. He's saying there is a supernatural, not flesh and blood enemy uh, behind uh, superstitious idolatry and so on. So you you think of something like uh, the, the papacy and the Roman religion. And we, we recognize that it is one of the devil's greatest masterpieces in the history of the world because you have some truth that is mixed with uh, damnable uh, errors, right? And the, they're, they're blended together, but it makes it, the chameleon tactics that are used by Rome make it so deceptive and ensnare people. But what's behind this? I mean, this is flagrant idolatry, right? We have, we have men standing before others and saying that this piece of bread is in fact the God of heaven who saved you. People venerate and worship that bread and they claim to re-sacrifice the Lord Jesus Christ again. It is a damnable and a satanic doctrine. And it is the devil that is behind such uh, idolatry. It's no wonder if you've been abroad and, um, and been by one of these great Roman Catholic cathedrals, despite all the architectural beauty, it's no wonder that so many Christians find them eerie, right? They're, they're houses of demons. I mean, they're, they're full of all sorts of, of, uh, of mischief that's taking place there. And the same thing could be said for other things. He's saying, we're not just wrestling against flesh and blood. There is something more. And this is why we're told elsewhere in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verses uh, 4 and 5, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. Well, our weaponry isn't of the characteristics of flesh and blood. It's not carnal, but it's mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and so on. So we have spiritual struggle with a spiritual enemy, and his power is one of su- that is supernatural. It's significant. So he's described as the ruler of this world. He's described as the prince of the power of the air, and language like that, a force to be reckoned with, though, as we have made abundantly clear, nothing in comparison to God himself and his power, who has vanquished the devil in his work on the cross. But what characterizes this power? Notice the language of our text against spiritual wickedness in high places. People want to make the devil a play toy. They want to make the devil to be something that's funny. Or people think, well, you know, there's things that are wrong, but uh, it's not too uh, much to be concerned about, not too fearful. That's not the language that we're given in the Holy Scripture. Not at all. It is described here as spiritual wickedness. It is diabolical. It is the depth of uh, an inferno of evil that we find in the devil. It is something that does not have any moral principle 
connected with it. The devil doesn't have any moral principles, right? There's, there's no code of honor with the devil. There is deep-rooted hatred and hostility against all that is good. And we need to recognize that that's the case, right? So when people uh, think, well, seances, uh, it's no big deal, you know, Ouija boards and these sorts of things, as if playing with the devil is something that is entertaining. And we need to be abhorred by such things. We need to recognize that it is ignorance which leads to such things. Now, he uses different tactics, doesn't he? There are some times when he comes to bully, and so he'll come with fierce persecution. But then other times he comes to beguile and not bully and to uh, work perversion. And so if the devil is able to push people off one side of the table, well enough. And if not, he'll pull them off the other side of the table. There's a diversity of forms of wickedness that this comes. Beguiling is as dangerous as, as bullying is. And yet we were conscious that it is derived power, as we saw last week. Right? The, not, he cannot lay his hand on a hair of anyone's head outside of God's control. And we see that with, with Job, for example. His power is limited and it is derived. We saw last week, limited in time, limited in, in place as well. We see something then of this supernatural uh, power. That means, of course, that it requires supernatural resources. If you're, you're hoping to beat your friend, children, at chess, well, you might go and read a bunch of chess books and study some of the famous chess matches and, you know, the masters, uh, chess masters of old, or you might get tips from someone who knows about such things, you might practice, you'd have all sorts of resources that you could draw on to help you improve at perhaps conquering or winning in a chess match against your friend. That's not the kind of resources we have when it comes uh, to fighting against the devil. And it's certainly not the idea of superstitious, uh, magical powers that we either desire or stand in, in need of. The Lord has armed us chiefly with his, with his word, right? The Lord did not say uh, to his uh, church, go into all nations and exercise, uh, exercise all of the demons out of everyone. He never said that, did he? He said, go and preach the gospel. Go and teach them all things that I have commanded to you. The way in which we see the devil's influence receded is chiefly through the proclamation of God's word accompanied by his Holy Spirit, which delivers souls that are under the bondage of the devil and delivers souls which are, have minds that are darkened by the devil and which are under the, the, the influences of all of the wicked lusts, sees them snatched, as it were, from brands the fire, from the fire and drawn savingly through the, the proclamation of the gospel to the Lord Jesus Christ. To be free in Christ is to be free indeed. And the way in which we come to Christ is through the means he's given to us in his word by pointing people uh, with the gospel to uh, Christ himself. And so the ideas that are spun into the hearts and minds of men, falsehood and error and wickedness and perversity and heresy and so on, Paul says these things are pulled down. In 2 Corinthians 10, they're pulled down by a knowledge of the truth. We're bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We're actually ripping to shreds, demolishing strongholds within the thinking and minds of men and in our own minds through the truth of God's word. And so the chief battlefield on which the war is being waged is, is the mind, isn't it? And that's not the only battlefield, but it's the chief battlefield on which uh, war is being waged, which is why as you look at each of the armor, pieces of armor that the Lord gives us, they're connected to that, uh, that basic idea 
your loins girt about with truth. It's truth that's given, a breastplate of righteousness, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, a shield of faith, wherewith we're able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one, a helmet of salvation, and so on. And of course, our only offensive, or our primary offensive weapon, the sword of the Spirit, which is uh, the word of, of God. And so when we, when we see, for example, errors that are infiltrating the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We recognize it's not just someone trying to, to increase their pay grade by spinning theological innovation that may, be a, 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 that may be a contributing factor. The devil has an interest in these things. He has an interest in trying to dislodge uh, the truth from the church of the Lord Jesus Christ or, or to twist it or to bring uh, perverted nuance to it, and so on. We see something of the enemy's uh, power. Secondly, we see something of the enemy's plan. So back in chapter 4 uh, and verse 14, it says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even uh, Christ. Now we know that the Lord is uh, at work in enabling us to stand against the wiles, to withstand the wiles of the devils. You, you take that word wiles. It has the idea of something that is cunning, something that has a s s scheme about it, scheming or, or strategy. In fact, when, when Paul's writing to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 11, he says this in verse 3, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, that is his cunning, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. He's saying to the Corinthians, I'm concerned about this, this cunning work of the devil where he beguiles from the beginning uh, to the present. So there's the, there are these wiles, this, this strategy of scheming. And it's, it's really, uh, for the most part, what we might refer to as guerrilla type of, of warfare. Right? As, as Paul's saying there, there's subtlety in the devil's uh, attacks. What do I mean by that? What I mean is, God says in 2 Corinthians 11 that the devil comes as an angel of light. So he doesn't come uh, presenting himself as this astronomical, you know, terrifying uh, beast, but rather he'll present himself as an angel of light. And his ministers are also of light. They, they follow that same pattern. And so there's, there's often diversion. The devil will copycat the Lord in some way. I mean, this isn't a sermon on Romanism, but you see it wonderfully displayed there. There's a copycat, right? You have Christ who's the head of the church, then you have a copycat. You have the Pope who claims to be head of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have, you know, uh, the gospel ministry, and you have the, uh, the priesthood, and you have uh, the gospel itself, and then you have uh, a gospel that is convoluted, that, that it brings in the, the sacraments and works and penance and all sorts of other things in, in with it, but it has the appearance of Christian religiosity. That's true, though. Generally speaking, the devil's goal is either to lead us into sin or to lead us to sin or to separate us from God. That's the goal. Right? There are two, two sides of a coin. And he has significant skill in this. I mean, he's had 6,000 years to hone and practice and try all of the tricks of, of the trade. And so he seeks to attack uh, weaker parts. And there, there are areas. So you think in terms of our own Christian, warf our own Christian walk uh, before the Lord, we have areas where we've grown in grace and we have areas still needing to grow in grace. We have 
strengths that God has given to us, the way that he's dealt with us, we still have attending weaknesses that are a part of our life as well. Well, the devil's no dummy. He's going to, he's going to either go to the weak points where we're, we're more vulnerable, or there'll be times when we have a sense of self-confidence in our areas of strength, and that will be where he'll strike, and it'll be the area we think we're strongest in, and the artillery will be directed there. Often it is with stealth. This has carries, this is subsumed under the idea of wiles, right? He'll come in ways that are least detected in our life. So it's the, it's the little foxes that spoil the vines, as we read in the Song of Songs. The Lord, uh, the, the devil will come and it'll be little compromises, which seem to cost us not much. And there's subtlety there, and we, we begin to acclimate. Let me, let me illustrate this for a second. You have a person that's a professing Christian, and it's discovered that they have fallen into serial adultery, and they're being disciplined for it. And you, you look at their upbringing, and you say, well, they're raised in this, you know, maybe a conservative, godly home, and they've had, uh, this is the atmosphere in which they've grown up in. How did they get to that position? And I'm here to tell you, from 20 years of pastoral experience, it wasn't with a single leap. It wasn't with a single leap. If you took that person where they started and then put them into certain circumstances, they would feel overwhelmingly uncomfortable. They could never dream of being in certain places and doing certain things. But what happens? There's a a small compromise. And it's a little uncomfortable, but they acclimate to it, and they become accustomed to it and comfortable with it. Then there's another compromise that takes them a step further. They acclimate again and become comfortable with that. And three or four steps later, now they're more comfortable with things than they would have never dreamt of being before. And that, that, continues, to, to, that continues on. And the sin and the types of sin... Uh, increase in greater and greater degrees of, of heinousness. There's, there's stealth that is involved. There are seasons at which the devil knows to strike, when we are uh, most fragile. It's, it is, it's not shocking, with a little bit of thought, that the devil comes to tempt the Lord Jesus Christ in the wilderness after 40 days of fasting. So there's the isolation, there's vulnerability, there's, you know, humanly speaking, all of these things, the, the um, weakness of body and, and so on and so forth. The devil strikes us in, at particular seasons. It may be after a victory. So it may be, it may be on the heels of, of, of spiritual triumph in our life. So there's Paul, and he's taken up into the third heavens. And it's after that that the devil comes and, and uh, he's given this affliction, right? We're told that it's, a, uh, uh, that it's uh, the devil himself that's, that's attacking him. He has this thorn in the flesh to humble him. Or you think of Peter, who, from all outward appearances, is standing strong with the Lord. And he's saying, my allegiance is unflinching. I will never, ever, ever deny you and I will stand with you to the end. The problem is that Peter is saying all of that, not in humble dependence, but in a measure of personal chutzpah, standing in his own strength, and it's on the heels of that that he uh, does uh, betray the Lord. You think of Lot, who is in the cave, again, a a period uh, where he's more susceptible uh, to uh, temptation, and so there are seasons that we are to be aware of with regards to the enemy's plan. We're conscious. We're in a war. We're not asleep. We're not sleepwalking. We realize that this is serious business, and so we're alert to the fact. I have strengths that need to be watched. I have weaknesses that need to be watched. I need sentinels on the guard, on guard in my mind, in my heart, in my affections. I'm conscious of the seasons of life. I'm going, I'm going into a period of a time of year or after certain circumstances or in other situations where I'm more vulnerable. We're alert to those things. I mean, it's foolish, utterly foolish not to be. As I said, sometimes the, the, 
the temptations come unexpectedly and alarmingly from the least anticipated quarters. I mean, Job is broken down before the Lord, and in the midst of all of the heavy burdens that he's been given, and his commitment to receive from the hand of the Lord all that God has laid on him and to bow down and worship, his own wife comes and tells him to curse God and to die. And this is a this is a shocking and alarming assault when he is needing at the time, you know, strength and encouragement in the right thing. So there's the devil's plan includes strategy. He'll conceal his purpose, of course. He doesn't come to Eve, as I've noted this before. He doesn't come to Eve and say, here's the fruit God's forbidden. Pulls back the curtain. Take a look at these gruesome scenes. Here is Cain, your own son, whom you gave birth to. And here is your other son, Abel, whom you gave birth to. And here is Cain physically killing his brother and pouring out his blood upon the ground. And look at all of, the, all of the events of history in terms of genocide and rape and murder and all of the other terrible things, the proliferation of idolatry and so on and so on and so forth. See all of that? Now, um, having shown you all of that, this is what you need to eat. He doesn't do that. He conceals his purpose. He, he says, you know, do you want to be like God? Do you want to know good and evil? Look how beautiful, attractive, irresistible it is. It'll gratify your senses. So what the devil does this? He comes and he conceals. And so a person says, this looks attractive, pleasurable, enticing. It may be nursing an old wound of bitterness. It may be giving vent to your temper. It may be... Um, lust and sexual immorality. It may be all sorts of things. And it seems, seems as if this is something that would be gratifying. And yet it's destructive and it is dishonoring to God and it is breaking down the soul. And the devil builds a fort where those potential gains can be, can be had. But he also is very, not only does he strategize to lead us to sin, he also strategizes to keep us from God because the Lord, of course, is our source of life and light and grace. What we need is daily repentance. What we need is contrition for sin. What we need is growing faith in Christ. What we need is to see more of the glory of God. What we need is, and we could go on and on and on. Those are the things that the devil has an interest in blockading. And so the, the devil will distort both God and our own view of ourselves or attempt to do so. So, for example, the devil, you know, you, you need to be engaged in tilling up your own heart before the Lord. But the, the temptation that would come from the devil would be, oh, these things aren't that significant. These aren't significant at all. God is too merciful and he doesn't care about such things. There's subtlety in that, but it's a snare. Or it may go the other direction. Your sins are too heinous. They are so wicked, and you've committed them so many times. God is too holy to look upon you. And there's no sense in asking him forgiveness. You're a hypocrite. You should keep these things to yourself. Or it could be that we, we become puffed up with conceit. We begin comparing ourselves to others and say, well, I have my problems, but they're not other people's problems. And I know other people near and dear to me whose problems are far worse, and so I don't have much to be concerned about. I could multiply examples. But in each of these, underneath all of it is a hook. It is a snare. It is a trap, namely to keep us from close fellowship with the Lord, to keep us from seeking God's face in his word and in his prayer and prayer and in the means of grace, keeping us from um, real soul exercise, making us content with merely the formality of a routine of religion and not actually seeking God's face in the means of grace, not repenting particularly over our particular sins, as our confession says, 
and not seeking God's grace for the moment-by-moment strength that we need from his hands. Anytime you get a thought in your head that, whether it's from your own erring heart or the suggestion of nonsense from someone else or a temptation from the devil, you get a thought in your head that leads you to either lower God's glory or to distance yourself from the Lord, there is a problem, and you need to be conscious of it. As I said, he's been honing his his methods for millennia, and you can go back and see it in the history of the world. I mean, there are big events as well as in the the little events of the lives of God's people, but, you know, I, I go back and I read about Nicaea in 325 A.D., and, and what, what's going on there? I mean, you have Athanasius with this teeny tiny little minority of Orthodox men, and then you have uh, the Arius and the Arians with their band, and then you got a big chunk in the middle who don't know what to think. And all of the things that are going on politically and in terms of the, the church and theologically and the tactics and so on, it wasn't just, you know, one stick in the mud Orthodox guy and another very charismatic, very persuasive heretic who are just doing their thing. There's more going on. We're we're, we're not just warring against, wrestling against flesh and blood. The aim, of course, was to unhinge the church's attachment to the full deity of the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. And so that continues to be the case for us. Thirdly, and very briefly, uh, the enemy's peril. We're called upon to fight. Now, children, you're called upon day by day, in many cases, not to fight, right? So your mom and dad are saying, don't fight with your brother, don't fight with your sister, and that's true. So there are, there are plenty of reasons uh, w- w- when it is sinful to fight, and we don't go out and just, when someone does something we don't like, even as adults, we don't get into fisticuffs with them and start throwing punches and so on. But there are good times to fight, aren't there? If someone's trying to seriously hurt your sister, you have an obligation to defend her. And there are other occasions, just war and so on, where it's appropriate. But this, my friends, is one where it is not only eminently important, it is essential for us to be engaged in open hostility against all the devil and and all that he, he stands for. It's, it, should send, it should send chills down our spine. Jesus comes to Peter. This again makes it very personal. He comes to Peter and Jesus looks Peter in the eye and he says, the devil wants to sift you as wheat. That's very personal. And of course Jesus says, but I've prayed for you. And he's going to be kept but we're conscious we are in hostile circumstances that require great vigilance. When Paul's writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, no man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Now, he's talking about enduring hardness as a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ and you know, discipline and Christian graces and so on. But what he describes there is true in this circumstance as well. We can't be mindless. We can't be disengaged. We can't be unplugged. We can't be naive. A soldier's vigilant. He's trained. He's thoughtful. He's alert. He's, he is engaged in the responsibilities that have given him, that, that have been entrusted to him. We're not in a position as Christians to say, we can hang up our armor in a trophy, in a trophy case and coast, right? We're going to die with our armor on. I mean, that's, that's the truth. We hang up our armor at death when we go to glory and not before then. That's why Paul's saying to the very end of his life, within weeks of dying, I have fought the good fight. He's saying right to the end. I'm not to relent, to take my ease before I reach the end of his own war, his portion of of the war. And so we're to be vigilant. We're vigilant, of course, 
in our, our daily activity. So what does that mean? We, we do get our tail kicked sometimes by temptation. We lose, we fall. And the Lord does that, among other things, to humble us. He permits that to happen. You fall prey to a temptation. Your response to falling prey not only includes repentance, which it must, but a measure of self-examination. There, the Lord uses that to humble us. I, you know, you're brought palatably to realize how weak, fragile, exposed, dependent, proud, thoughtless you are. You know, to fall prey to this temptation or that exposes you and should humble you and break you before the Lord. But it means that we have to be, we have to be skilled with the sword that the Lord has given to us. We have to be soaked in the scripture. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. We need to have spiritual discernment. We need to be able to take the word of God and be applying it accurately, faithfully to the particulars of our circumstances in life. That requires us to be soaking in the word of God. Now, having said that, let me say this, and this is very important. The whole, as we saw last week, but I'll repeat here, the whole background for this cosmic war, fought and won, lies chiefly at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Christ is not, Christ is a savior. He's not only a savior. The Lord Jesus Christ is a king, and we're told that he is the captain of the Lord's host, the great armies of heaven. He's the captain. Our Savior is also a warrior, and our Savior has waged war against the devil, and in his cross work, his death, and his burial and resurrection and ascension, he's triumphed over the devil. So he has crushed the head of the serpent, as was promised. He has made an open show of these principalities and powers. He's defeated hell, defeated sin, defeated the devil, defeated death itself. And for that reason, you know, as the soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ, our eyes are to be glued on our captain, not on the enemy. Our, while we're aware of the wiles and the snares and the devices of the enemy, our eyes are glued on our captain. He has already defeated the devil. The reason the devil flees from us, the reason that we even have the capability of quenching his fiery darts is because all that the Lord Jesus Christ has secured for his people in his saving work. And so Christ is first and last, the captain of the Lord's host. He is our Lord, our King, our Savior, and our eyes. What is necessary is close fellowship with him and constant application of all that Christ has secured for us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit to our own souls. It's the ministry of the Spirit that takes the things of Christ and enables sin to be killed within us, enables our eyes to be enlightened, to behold what is true and what is false, to discern between good and evil. It is God's Spirit working by, with, and through His Word that we are thereby furnished with the ability to, to wage this, this open war. Two points, and I'll close. First of all, to the, the unbeliever. We, we, we read about these things, we hear about these things from God's word, but there are some pretty, pretty uh, important implications that flow from them. If you are outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, what does that mean? It means that you are, you are, you're in this gigantic cosmic war and you are no match for the devil. So take, for example, the sons of Sceva. They're watching Paul, and he's casting out demons, preaching the gospel, and so on. They think, oh, we'll take this. These are Jews, unconverted Jews. And so they try to do the same. And what happens? The sons of Sceva are thrashed. They are thrashed. They are sent out of the house 
licking their wounds as a result. Why? Because outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, I mean, the demon says, we know Jesus and we know Paul, but who are you? Outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, the unbeliever is no match for the devil. Not only so, but the Bible tells us that they're under the influence, under the tyranny, under the captivity, under the dominion, under the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, are captive to him. And so, of course, there is a powerlessness that is attached uh, with that. It ought to be, if we're understanding uh, the truth of God's word, it ought to be uh, a means, these truths, of awakening, awakening us to how desperate our circumstances are. Pray God that he would, by his Holy Spirit, use his word uh, to, to alert and arouse us, those outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the perilous circumstances one is in. I mean, Jesus goes to the Pharisees who are outside of Christ, and he says, you are like your father, the devil. For every person outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ought to come like a thunderbolt to the soul. Thou art like thy father, the devil. Is it that bad? Indeed, it is that bad. It's why hell is the shared uh, place of both the unconverted and the devil for all of eternity. It alerts us to what need there is for a great Savior. And secondly, for the Christian, while we can say to the unbeliever, you're no match for the devil, we can say to the Christian inside the Lord Jesus Christ, he is no match for us in Christ Jesus. He does indeed flee from the Lord's people. His fiery darts are indeed quenched when uh, rebuffed with the shield of faith. And the Lord's people are able to stand he says, stand therefore having your loins girt about with the truth. The Christian is able indeed to stand against all of this, not in our own strength, but in the strength and grace that is to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And the Christian takes great, great encouragement in that, that when the enemy comes in like a flood, that the Lord will raise up a standard against him and that the Lord is pleased to deliver all who are his uh, from from the wiles and the snares of the one who would seek to lead us captive. This is why we're taught to pray in the Lord's prayer, deliver us from evil, right? It's as, as I think I covered when preaching through the Lord's prayer in, in Luke, it's not just evil as in all that is evil. It could be translated the evil one. Both, of course, are applicable. Keep us from temptation and deliver us from the evil one. That is a prayer the Lord hears and the Lord answers uh, by his, his grace. And so we are engaged in a spiritual war with uh, spiritual weaponry against a spiritual supernatural enemy who has been defeated by our Savior who enables us to resist him. Let's stand together for prayer. Lord our God, we thank you and praise you that you are a refuge and a strong tower for your people, that we are to run and able to run uh, into Christ and to find uh, deliverance and safety and protection and defense. And Lord, we, we thank you that you have enlisted us uh, as, as, as those who are engaged in this uh, open frontal assault against uh, the enemy of all that is good, the enemy, the adversary of, 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 of you and the accuser of the brethren. Uh, o oh Lord, grant that we would be uh, good soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ, walking in sweet and uh, careful communion with you as those soaked in your word who are alert and vigilant, awake, uh, that we would watch and pray uh, knowing that the flesh is weak, but that the spirit is willing. Oh Lord, we pray that you would furnish us with, uh, continue to furnish us with this, this armor, uh, 
that in an evil day we might nevertheless be enabled to give you glory. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together from Psalm 74, verses 20 to 23 the tune Ferent, which is number 61, Psalm 74, verses 20 to 23, to tune number 61. Unto thy covenant have respect, for earth's dark places be full of the habitations of horrid cruelty. O let not those that be oppressed return again with shame. Let those that poor and needy are give praise unto thy name. Do thou, O God, arise and plead the cause that is thine own. Remember how thou art reproached still by the foolish one. We'll sing together verses 20 to 23. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.